Good morning. Uh, by the grace of God, we are coming to the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 12. And before we go any further, let us again seek the Lord in prayer. You pray with me. Our fathers, we come to you this morning. We rejoice to declare that Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. We love our King. We want to know him more and to see him known and glorified. And Father, we know that you have given us your word that we might know you and your son and, and what you have done. Father, we know that your truth, that your word is truth without error. Father, we ask that you would protect us from introducing any error today. Lord, as I seek to explain and apply the text, Lord, protect the words from my mouth. Let me say nothing that is, that is wrong. And Father, as we hear your word, protect us from, from misunderstanding and misinterpreting and misapplying. Lord, don't let us be those whom you warn, the ignorant and unstable who twist and pervert Scripture to their own destruction. Lord, we want your truth because we want you to be glorified in us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, we are in Daniel chapter 12 this morning, the, the end of the book. Over the last four plus months, we have worked through the book of, of Daniel, we are reaching really the, the climax. You know, Manny, just last week, he posted a video from the top of Camelback <coughs> Mountain. There's a long climb to get to the top, and then a beautiful view once you're there. And that's, that's where we are, the book of Daniel. Although the view was beautiful the entire way up, we're, we're at the peak. Um, throughout the rest of the book of Daniel, we've seen examples for us to imitate and truths for us to grasp. But, but here in chapter 12, we see the, the greatest, I believe, greatest parts of the book. We see the greatest warning in the book of Daniel and the greatest promise in the book of Daniel and, and the greatest charge in the book of Daniel, all here in Daniel chapter 12. There, there are things in Daniel, and especially here in Daniel chapter 12, that are hard to understand. In fact, things that Daniel himself says, I did not understand. Too often we're focused to, to we're, I'm sorry, we're tempted to focus upon those things. The obscure instead of the obvious. But it's the obvious truths of Daniel 12 that carry the weight and the, the power of the passage. We're tempted to focus on the obscure things because we can, we can make eschatology a puzzle that we can play with and we can feel like I'm doing well just because I think I've figured out what this time, times, and half a time means. Because I've got an idea of these 1,290 days, yes, I'm, I'm doing well. But we, we do that and we have this puzzle rather than seeing the, the clear warnings and commands of Scripture that we need to cling to and submit ourselves under. We're going to address both the, the obvious and the obscure today, but if you're looking for a definition, an exact timeline of these 1,290 days, you will leave disappointed. I don't have a chart. It's the obvious meaning of the text that's going to have an eternal impact upon our souls. So let us read the text, Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. 
And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So Daniel chapter 12 begins with a warning. This warning is a warning of distress, even of disaster. Daniel 12, 1, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation until that time. So at the very beginning, we also have an obscure part of Daniel. Who is Michael? There's really two possible understandings of Michael. Many of the Reformers and Puritans thought that Michael was a name for Jesus Christ. I have a book on my bookshelf in that office there titled, Michael and the Dragon, or Satan Defeated and Christ Vindicated, They're using Michael as Jesus. John Calvin thought that Michael was Jesus Christ. I respect their opinion. But Jude chapter 9 says the archangel Michael. So I lean strongly to understand that Michael is perhaps a, a type, a representation of Jesus, but he is in reality an archangel. We're told here he's, he's this great prince, this great ruler. He's a powerful angel who has charge of your people, the, the people of God. He fights for and he protects God's People. Revelation chapter 12, we're told that it's Michael who leads the rest of the angels of heaven against the dragon who is Satan and his angels. It's Michael who defeats Satan and casts him out of heaven. That sounds like it should be a great thing, right? Satan defeated, the dragon cast down. And ultimately, it, it is a good thing. It's a great thing. But it comes with some temporal, some earthly consequences. Michael I'm sorry, Revelation 12, 14 says that after Satan, the dragon, is, is cast down, that he becomes furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Two verses earlier, again at the downfall of the dragon, um, John writes, So rejoice, O you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe! to the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So the rise of Michael, the downfall of Satan, is excellent news for the people of God. But it will lead to a time of trouble, a time that, that has never been since there was a nation till that time. From, from the very beginning 
of the history of Israel until this time. There, there's never been trouble like this. And we think about the history of Israel, and it is a history of trouble from, from beginning to end. They had their time of, of generations of slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. As, as they come into the promised land, there's this constant cycle of oppression by the peoples of the land. Once the, the kingdom is established and they're, they're free from all these oppressors, then the kingdom is split between Israel and Judah. And Israel is conquered by Assyria and led off into captivity. And Judah is conquered by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And, and the temple is destroyed and they're taken off into captivity. In Daniel's writing towards the, the close of that exile, as they're attempting to rebuild the temple. But, and we, we talked about this in Daniel chapter 10, you know, no sooner does the rebuilding of the temple begin than opposition arises, and the work stops for 20 years. And then in the near future, what's already been, been prophesied in, in Daniel 11, we see the, the deprivations of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, um, who murders the high priest, um, sacrifices pigs, unclean animals, upon the altar. He forbids circumcision. He forbids the worship of the Lord. In 70 AD, there's the destruction of Jerusalem. I mean, the city is utterly devastated by the Romans. And, and, I mean, Josephus writes, nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the world before how fierce this destruction was. In more recent days, the Jewish people have endured the, the Holocaust. Six million Jews murdered by Nazis. And then, even after the nation of Israel was reestablished, they're, they're still under constant assaults from the Islamic world around them that denies them a right to exist. And the Jews are not the only troubled people. If you just look at the history of the world, it's a history of trouble after trouble. We, we can't name all of them, but just, just think of a few. Um, in Europe, prior to the Reformation, Black Death, this bubonic plague that spreads across Europe, and over, according to one historian, over 60% of the population of Europe dies. More than half. We have the atrocities, the massive amounts of death brought about through two world wars. We have a long history of, of slavery, of drug wars, of dictatorships, of anarchy and lawlessness, of terrorism. A study of history reveals that people are very good at being very evil. And if those things seem too abstract, I mean, we can look at them and agree, yes, this was a very bad thing, but sometimes we don't, we don't feel it, then just... Just consider the trouble in your own life. I, I know we all have very different experiences. I don't believe anyone here has experienced trouble like the things we've just named, not to that same extent. But, but we've all had times where we just seem completely overwhelmed by what's happening to us. And there's nothing we can do but, but cry and pray and hope that this time will pass, and that the trouble will leave. And the warning here, again, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is this, this trouble that is coming is going to be worse. Nothing that you have ever endured is going to be as terrible as this time of trouble that is coming. Nothing that anyone has ever endured will be like this time of trouble that is coming against the people of God. We're already experiencing a foretaste of this trouble now. All that history of the world is, is a foreshadowing of this trouble. We have brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who are already much further into that trouble than we are here in our country. But there is trouble now. There's worse to come. And so... It's natural to ask, what should we do because of this trouble? And it seems like the, the most natural response is, let's flee the wrath to come. Which is good when we're talking about God's wrath, but it's an error 
here. How, how can we escape this time of trouble, the, the wrath of the dragon? There's a very easy way to escape the worst of this trouble. The dragon has come down in great fury to make war. If you don't want to endure that trouble, then make peace with the dragon. As we just read in, in Luke 4, you know, Satan says, All the kingdoms of the world have been given to me. They're mine. I have authority over them. And he says to Jesus, I can give you their authority and glory if you'll just worship me. He, he says to us, not that he'll give us authority over them, but I can give you all the benefits, all the pleasure, all the praise and approval of these kingdoms in this culture if you just come over to my side. The dragon is happy to accept defectors. All you need to do is, is abandon God, forsake his people, and, and give glory to the dragon. That's the path to an easy life and a comfortable life. Listen to the world and go along with what it says. Right. But we can't do that. It, it would be the height of foolishness for us to do that. Because after this warning of distress, there's a promise of a coming deliverance. It's the second sentence, in, still in this first verse. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Now this deliverance doesn't mean you will escape the trouble. It doesn't mean nothing will ever harm you or make you uncomfortable. It's a promise that the trouble will come to an end and it will not destroy you. You will come safely through the trouble. After darkness, there will be light. The nature of the deliverance is given in verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Even if you die in this trouble, and if you come back this evening, um, we're going through Acts 12, see James, the brother of John, killed by Herod. You, you might die for the cause of Christ, because of the troubles of the world. But even if you die, it will not be the end. That the many here, it doesn't mean many, but not all. This is not teaching that some people will not be raised. It's... it's Many, much, a multitude, the multitude, everyone who has ever lived will be raised either to everlasting life or to everlasting shame and contempt. Um, Revelation chapter 20 makes it clear that it's all the dead, great and small. Everyone will be raised, everyone will be judged, and everyone will go to one of these two eternal destinies, life or contempt, paradise or fire. What determines the outcome? Who will be delivered? Who are those raised to life? And who are those raised to contempt? It comes down to, is your name written in the book? Those whose names are written in the book will be raised to life. Revelation 21, 27 says that the only people allowed into the new Jerusalem are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And Revelation 20.15, we John, John is clearly working from an understanding of Daniel as he's writing, as the revelation is given to him. Revelation 20.15, we see the dead raised and brought before the judgment seat of God, and books are opened, and everyone is judged according to what they have done. But according to what they have done, everyone ends up in the same place. If their name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, they are thrown into the lake of fire. The devil is thrown into the lake of fire. Hades and death itself are thrown into the lake of fire. When it, when it comes to this last day, it won't matter who your parents are. It won't matter where you lived or how you lived. It won't matter how much money you made or gave away. It won't matter how popular or respected you were. It won't matter how important you were. It won't matter how insignificant you were. You will be judged. You will end up either in everlasting life 
through everlasting contempt. Is your name written in this book? How can you get your name written in the book? You can't sneak it in there. You can't forge your name on, on the bottom of a page somewhere. You can't slip an extra page into the register. It's, it's the book. It's the record of the Lord. It's Malachi 3.16 describes it as the book of remembrance of those who feared the Lord and esteemed His name. It, it's His book. He's the only one who can write in it. That's right. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life if you are one of those who repent of their sins and trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Is your name written in the book? Do you want your name to be written in the book? That repent and believe and trust that God will do what He has said and your name will be written in the book. Jesus Christ took on flesh and dwelt among us. He perfectly fulfilled the law of God in His person. And He took upon Himself all of the sins of all of those who would ever believe in Him. He died at the hands of lawless men, but it was at the will of a just and righteous God. He satisfied the wrath of God against sins. And He rose from the grave and He ascended into Heaven, and He offers resurrection and eternal life to everyone who believes in Him. Believe this gospel. You will suffer for it because the dragon hates this gospel and the world follows the dragon. But it is far better to endure a lesser and temporary suffering in this world and then go into an eternal life of joy than to enjoy lesser, temporary, fleeting pleasures in this world and spend an eternity in an eternal, contempt contemptible fire forever and ever. Allow me to say a few more words just on, on the contemptibility of hell. I, I, I want this has worked for me, I, I want to enlarge our hatred and revulsion of hell mm -hmm. so that we would be spurred on to pursue heaven more earnestly. We, we often think of hell just in terms of suffering. And it is a place of suffering. But it's also a place of shame and everlasting <clears throat> contempt. Opponents of the gospel and, and champions of humanism will often speak as if God were unjust and monstrous and that there's something noble in suffering because of your opposition to this unjust God. Um, there's one, one man has said, and I'm sure others have said it as well, that if such a God does exist, such a God as the Bible teaches, such a God does exist, then I would gladly go to hell. And anyone who worships such a, a being is, is immoral and unjust. There's this, this idea that you know, even if these things are true, they're just wrong. And, and you know, I'd be glad to suffer because I'll feel I'll know that I did the right thing in resisting this, this tyrant God who has power over us. This, you know, I'll, I'll know that I'm independent and self-determining. And as, as Frank Sinatra sang, I did it my way. This idea that even as I suffer these pains, people will look at me with admiration because I stood on my own two feet. And we do look with admiration upon people who have suffered unjustly in the face of evil. Um, American North American, United States of American hero, Nathaniel Hale in the American Revolution was executed by the British soldiers, and, and he's a hero. He said, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Um, I thought he was a Latin American hero, but Danny told me I was mistaken. Uh, Francis de Miranda was a Venezuelan prior to Simone de Bolivar, who fought for, he fought in the American Revolution and the French Revolution, and then he fought for Spanish, um, for independence from Spain, 
for South America. He got thrown in prison and, and died there. He lost. We think, you know, it's great that he fought against colonialism. Um, in, in South Africa, you know, we, we rightly admire Nelson Mandela for enduring decades in prison for fighting against apartheid government. Um, we rightly admire such men who suffer for righteous causes. But it will not be so with those in hell. Those who continue their rebellion against God will not be admired for their self-determination, their stubbornness, their, their independence. No one will look upon you in hell and say, what a man to stand up in the face of God and suffer the consequences. If you go to hell, not one being in creation will ever consider you anything but a fool, mm -hmm. a despicable buffoon who rejected everything good and holy in order to cling to filth and wickedness. They'll, they'll say the words of Psalm 52, 7, See the man who would not make God his refuge, who trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. What a fool. There, there will be no honor, no admiration. They are forever objects of shame and contempt. So don't be a fool. Don't be shameful. Don't be contemptible. Make God your refuge. He holds out His hands all day long to deliver you. There's nothing noble or commendable in rejecting His mercy. The promise is enlarged upon in verse 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This, this isn't giving us subsets of those people whose names are written in the book. It's, it's not like God has a ledger and says, okay, Manny, I guess IQ doesn't cover wisdom, but you know, Manny has a wisdom quotient of 122, so you'll be this bright. And you know, Danny made it up to 134, so he's going to be a little bit brighter. And you know, Jacob led 15 people to Christ, so he's going to be a dim star. But John you know, led 45 people to Christ, so we'll make him brighter. Um, that's, that's not what this is, is talking about. Every one of the people of God is wise. And every one of the people of God turns many to righteousness. We, have, we are wise because we have the wisdom of God, because the Holy Spirit indwells us and enlightens us and gives us understanding of the things of God. If you are trusting in Christ, you have made the wisest decision that anyone can ever make. And, and everything else becomes rather inconsequential right. compared right. to that. And whether your evangelistic efforts are met with the success of a Spurgeon or a Whitfield, or it seems like you spend your entire life just planting seeds that, in a field that remains barren forever... John writes, we are fellow workers with them in the truth. We, we strive side by side for the sake of the gospel. We're, we're not putting notches on our belt as we win people to the Lord. The church collectively is laboring to proclaim the gospel and bring in sinners to repentance. This, this is not... Try to get as bright as you can be. It's mm -hmm. trust in the glory that is going to be revealed in you. No one earns glory and righteousness in heaven. No one but Christ. But he shares his glory with us. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Mm -hmm. Romans eight seventeen. We are in Christ, we're children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. We share His glory. That is our brightness. We not only have everlasting life, but the brightness and glory 
the stars of the sky. It's your name written in the book. Have you claimed Are you trust in, in the promise? The next section of, of the chapter is the very obscure part. It's commanded to be shut up and sealed. And Daniel says, I didn't understand what I heard. It's what so many people want to focus upon. Daniel looks. He sees two others standing on, on either bank of the stream. And someone, not Daniel, someone says to the man above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be? Till the time of the end. And the man raises both hands, his right and left, towards heaven. He's, he's invoking a solemn oath. He swears by him who lives forever and ever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Then Daniel says, verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. A precise, a precise understanding of this time, times, and half a time is not given to us. We don't know exactly when this time will start. We don't know if it's going to last exactly three and a half years or if this is a metaphorical amount of time. We do know that it will last it will last until it will culminate with the shattering of the power of the holy people. When that shattering comes to an end, these things would be finished. Some want to, to read the holy people here as the Jewish nation. I, I disagree. We can't work through covenant theology or dispensationalism in its fullness right now. You might not even know what those things mean. That's all right. But Peter writes to the Christian church that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. I, I strongly feel the holy people, it's not, it's not ethnic Israel, it's spiritual Israel. It's, it's those, the people of God, those who trust in Christ. And, and their power will be shattered. You know, this is, this is the time of trouble. It, it'll seem not just personal trouble, but I mean, a collective trouble upon the church when, when just everything seems wrong. We seem powerless and the entire world is against us and everyone rejects the truth and, and we're persecuted for clinging to, to the truth. And we seem powerless, utterly ineffective in, in any way in our culture. And then I mean, he continues, verses 11 and, and 12. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who comes, who waits, and arrives at the 1,335 days. Again, Daniel doesn't, doesn't understand exactly what this means. He doesn't give a precise definition. People have tried to do all sorts of things with numbers and work out. It'll happen in this year. It will happen in this day. So, I mean, we can see easily how they get to some of those. Um, 1,290 days. So people, okay, well, 1,290 years. And we start from the crucifixion of Christ, or maybe the destruction of Jerusalem, Start Jerusalem so 70 AD, we add 1290, we get to 1360. There were people saying the world is going to end in 1360. There was that movement. Um, people more after 1360, they realized, well, that was wrong. So as John Calvin is writing, there's a large group of people who, they were a little further viewed, they added the 1290 and the 1335 and got 2600 ish. Um, 600 years from Daniel to the coming of Christ, and then 2,000 years after that. So the world went 2,000. So, I mean, they were looking a couple hundred years ahead, but we've made it past that 
point. Um, people try all sorts of things with math. There's someone who lives a few miles from here, um, who many of us know, um, who is absolutely convinced he's, he's done the math and, and read the secrets, and he has proclaimed publicly that Barack Obama is the Antichrist, that he's going to become the head of the United Nations, and that will start the 1,290 days, the time of trouble. It's pure speculation without foundation. We don't know exactly how and when these things will work themselves out. We can't know exactly how and when these things will work themselves out. We don't need to know exactly how and when these things will work themselves out. Jesus declared, Mark 13, 32, that no one knows concerning those days or hours. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. There will come a time of trouble. However long it lasts, and we know this with the trouble we've gone through, suffering that, that lasts for a day can still seem like it will never end. It, this trouble will seem like it will go on forever. But it will end. There, there is a limit to it. Okay. And after the abomination of desolation will come this blessed one. Things will appear darkest for the church just before dawn. We will be shattered. But he will come. And we will stand in our blotted place. We don't need to understand the details of the time. And we need to know what Daniel was told to do. So we, we end with the charge given to Daniel. The duty of Daniel. If you like alliteration, distress. Deliverance, duty. When Daniel asks in verse 8, My Lord, what should be the outcome of these things? Admitting he doesn't understand, he is told, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Go your way, Daniel. The revelation has been given to you. You've been given everything that you need to be given. You've written it down. Now, go your way. You have work to do, Daniel. The words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. He's told again in verse 13, but go your way till the end. This is the charge, Daniel, and to us. You don't need to know the days and hours of these things. You need to go and do what you've been told to do. Verse 10, many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. This, even though it's not given in an imperative, this is, this is what you should do. Daniel, you know this time of trouble is coming. You know that the people whose names are written in the book, the people of God, will be delivered. So go purify yourself, make yourself white, be refined. The wicked are going to keep acting wickedly. They'll act like these things will never come. Or if they come, they won't affect us too bad. So they're going to eat, drink, and be Mary. But the wise, those who understand, it's not saying they're going to understand the 1,290 days. They're going to understand what they need to do. Purify yourselves. Make yourself white. And what, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me white? Again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is not a call to personal self-improvement. It's a call to seek the righteousness of Christ through faith in Christ. To strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. But we strive by running after Christ. Whether this time of trouble, whether the end is, is coming in Ten minutes from now, or ten days from now, or ten thousand years from now. This is what we should be doing. Turn from our sins and turn to God. We should be like the wise virgins that Jesus talked of in Matthew 25. There's ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come for a wedding procession. And the job of the virgins 
is to have lamps to carry lights for this procession. And they come with their lamps. The lamps are lit. They're waiting for the bridegroom. He's not there when they expect him to be there. Some of these virgins were wise. Some were foolish. The difference was the wise virgins brought oil for their lamps. And the foolish ones didn't. If he had shown up right when they thought he would, they would have been fine. If they'd known exactly when he would arrive there, they could have gone and gotten more oil for their lamps, and they would have been fine. But they didn't know. They acted like it didn't matter that they didn't know. So the bridegroom arrives. While the virgins are asleep, the wise virgins wake up, they add their oil to their lamps, and they go with the bridegroom to the wedding feast. The foolish virgins... When they realize that they can't light their lamps because they have no oil, they go and they buy oil. And then they show up at the feast and they say, let us in. We're here for the feast. And the bridegroom says, I do not know you. And they're left outside in the darkness. Be like the wise virgins. Jesus, I mean, he, he even, I love it when Jesus applies his parables for us. I, I can tell you exactly what the parable means because Jesus told us what it means. He says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. You don't need to know when he's coming or when the trouble is coming. You need to be prepared for when he does and be about his business until he does. We need to live each moment of each day so that we will not be ashamed or embarrassed or caught unprepared if He returns right this moment. Right. And as we do our duty, we have this great assurance that the verse ends with. Verse 13, You shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Christians, God has an allotted place for us, a place of honor. He decreed that it would be yours, and He will bring you there. No matter what comes, God has an allotted place for you, and you shall rest and you shall stand there. You will not be lost, forsaken, or forgotten. Fear not, only believe. Fear not, only endure. Fear not, only obey. The greatest time of trouble will be followed by the ultimate eternal realm of joy. And we will be with Him. So let us press on to know Him. And let us pray together. Father, we ask that You'd help us not to occupy ourselves with things too high for us, that we would not exhaust ourselves running to and fro, seeking knowledge of things you have not revealed to us. The revealed things belong to us. Lord, help us to do what you have revealed, what you have told us to do. Help us to trust even in the darkness. Help us to cling to the promises Lord, may we be ever more and more refined by the blood of your Son applied through your Spirit. We ask these things because of the work of Jesus Christ and for the fame of Jesus Christ. Amen.